Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I would like to offer my personal opinion and my thoughts about Amber Heard based on the five-factor model of personality as well as any personality pathology that I see and mental illness as well. So the first thing I wanted to go over is what I think is her five-factor model profile. And you can remember these by the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And these are just different personality traits that each one of them has facets. Basically what sums up personality is different levels, whether that's high or low of these traits, and all together form the five-factor model of personality. So let's start with openness to experience. Openness to experience includes imagination, aesthetic sensitivity, attentiveness to inner feelings, preference for variety and intellectual curiosity. Usually people who are very high in openness to experience tend to be very intelligent people. I do think that Amber Heard's level of openness to experience might be medium, perhaps high. I mean, she is willing to experience new things. She appreciates the arts. She's curious. I don't think her openness level is low. I would think it's like mid to high. When it comes to conscientiousness, I do think her conscientiousness is a low. And this is because conscientiousness has to do with competence. It has to do with being very orderly, very methodical on everything. It's your level of dutifulness, achievement streaming, self-discipline. I don't see a lot of self-discipline in her. She is addicted to drugs, alcohol as well. Usually people who are on drugs have low conscientiousness. I see that she's an impulsive a wreck. Usually people with high conscientiousness are a lot more calm, rational, organized, planned even. When it comes to extroversion, I do think her level of extroversion isn't high either. This has to do with friendliness. She's not friendly. And gregariousness. Have you seen her being gregarious? I, I haven't. I personally haven't. She can be assertive when it's convenient to her, but that has more to do with manipulation rather than extroversion. Excitement seeking, okay, she is excitement seeking, but that is due to, I think, her personality pathology, not necessarily a high level of extroversion. When you are a person who are high in extroversion, you have a lot of positive emotions, and all I see in her are anger, negative emotion, victim mentality, just a lot of negativity. Agreeableness, I think she's very very low in agreeableness. She doesn't trust people. She has this high need of control. Um, people who are agreeable are less controlling and are more open-minded, more trusting, more altruistic. You know, they do things for others. People who are higher in agreeableness, they're also more compliant. I don't see her being compliant at all. They're modest. And if you have observed Amber, she's looking at everybody like, I'm up here on my high horse and y'all are down there. That I don't see that it's modest at all. Tender-mindedness. Please, she's like the opposite of tender-mindedness, okay? So I do think her agreeableness is a very low. And finally, the last trait is neuroticism. Amber is a very high, very, very high in neuroticism, in my opinion. Neuroticism has to do with negative emotions, impulsiveness, anxiety, depression. I don't necessarily see depression in her, but I see a lot of negativity and I see a lot of explosive anger that's just below the surface and it's like ready to explode at any given moment. Usually we see high neuroticism with people who have vulnerable narcissism, which is what I initially thought she had. But digging deeper, I do see more of a grandiose type narcissism, like the one we see in narcissistic personality disorder. And definitely I did see borderline personality disorder in her before I even knew that she had been diagnosed with borderline personality. And she also has been diagnosed with sociopathy. I didn't quite see that but I did see a lot of antisocial personality <laughs> disorder traits. And usually people who have sociopathy, they have comorbidity with antisocial personality disorder because they have a lot of overlapping features and similarities. Now, 
Keep in mind that sociopathy is no longer a clinical term. It was used in the past and people use it nowadays, but in a clinical field, it would not be called sociopathy. It would be called secondary psychopathy or factor two psychopathy. With that said, I do wanna dig deeper into specific things, even like body language and things like that, so that everything that I'm saying makes a sense. So I would love to share with you the borderline personality disorder diagnostic criteria that is listed in the DSM-5. Let's start with that. For somebody to have borderline personality, they have to meet five or more of these nine criteria. Chronic feelings of emptiness, emotional instability, frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, identity disturbance, impulsive behavior, inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty, controlling anger, a pattern of unstable personal relationships, recurrent suicidal behavior, and a stress-related paranoid ideation. Now let's go over the narcissistic personality disorder diagnostic criteria. The person has a grandiose sense of self-importance. The person is also preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty or the ideal love. The person believes that they're special or unique. The person requires excessive admiration. The person has a sense of entitlement. The person is exploitative, lacks empathy. This is a shared characteristic with antisocial personality disorder, but also with a borderline personality and people with sociopathy or factor two psychopathy do not experience remorse either. The person is often envious or jealous. This reminds me of when Johnny Depp was saying that she would get really, really mad when he would go visit his children because she wanted him to be there all the time to meet her needs. That's an example of jealousy. I do see certain traits of vulnerable narcissism in Amber. The first sign that you can see when you encounter a vulnerable narcissist is this victim mentality. And they're never going to admit that they have a victim mentality, but you can just observe that in their behavior. The person with this pathology does see themselves as a victim. And even when they're throwing pots and pans at somebody, in their mind, they always have a justification for it. Now, Amber was diagnosed with a secondary psychopathy. When it comes to factor two psychopathy, there is two different facets to it. The first facet would be social deviance or lifestyle. Lack of realistic long-term goals, impulsivity, and irresponsibility. I mean, guys, she meets all these traits. Now, there is a second part of factor two psychopathy, which is antisocial, has to do with poor behavioral control, early behavioral problems, juvenile delinquency, revocation of conditional release, and criminal versatility. Now, usually when somebody has been diagnosed with sociopathy, that person has comorbid antisocial personality disorder. Let's see the diagnostic criteria here. Pervasive pattern of disregard for and violation of the rights of others. So throwing objects at somebody, hitting somebody, that is a violation of their rights, okay? Since age 15, as indicated by three or more of the following. Failure to conform to social norms concerning lawful behaviors, such as performing acts that are grounds for arrest. For example, drugs. <clears throat> repeated lying and oftentimes compulsive lying actually cunning of others so manipulation impulsivity failure to plan this is a common trait with sociopathy irritability aggressiveness common traits with borderline personality and common traits with sociopathy right there reckless disregard for safety irresponsibility lack of remorse and the individual is at least 18 years of age. And with that said, I do believe that Amber Heard has the dark tetrad. This is when somebody is a narcissist, so narcissism, Machiavellianism, psychopathy, and sadism. So let's dig into the actual facts and what happened. So for the first year and a half, Johnny Depp actually said that she was a really lovely, she was just normal, 
and then all of a sudden after that time she started becoming very very hostile very demeaning to him so i don't know if you guys have ever dated a narcissist but usually they can be extremely persuasive during the love bombing phase this is when you first meet them they seem to share your same values your hobbies they seem to think very much alike um, you're just so fascinated by them and then as time goes by you're gonna start to see the real person this is not normal behavior guys you aren't just this lovely person at the beginning and then the monster shows that's personality pathology okay let's go to the actual footage When you have experienced trauma, when you are being beaten up by somebody, that is trauma. And so when you talk about it, you're not just chilled, drinking a glass of wine, eating, smiling, and this is the behavior that we see in her. When a trauma victim talks about trauma, they get tense. We lose our appetite. You know, you don't want to snack and eat. We're just real focused on what happened. And a lot of the times you can see that they, the person will like look away and then be really concentrated in like their thoughts and like trying to remember, right? Kind of like searching their memory cabinet. And you see Amber here like looking around, looking at people, eating her snacks like if she was at a party or something. She does not display behavior that shows that she has experienced actual trauma. Thank you. One time, um, Johnny was hitting me, and he was hitting me hard and repeatedly, and I was screaming. The security walks in, and they don't do anything about it. And there, he, 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 he makes this motion uh, when Jerry Judge yells, Fox or uh, Sean, I can't remember who it was, and um, and my, all we had was a little bit of separation, and my sister runs down the stairs, uh, it's a, we're on a landing in between two flights of stairs. Miss Hurd, I must interrupt you, you because can't. I've you can't. asked you a yes then or no withdraw question. Your, withdraw your question then, because Ms. she's Hurd, answering. prior to today's date, um, had had any time has Johnny have you ever hit Johnny Depp? Okay. You You've already asked and she's already answered and you interrupted her. Miss Hart, have you ever hit Johnny Depp prior to today? Judge your Vegas at times. Everyone on this side of the room, please. Objection three fifty two. It's not relevant to this domestic violence pursuit. Overruled. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Answer it however you want to, including the way you were just... I'm asking for a yes or no answer. You don't have to answer it the way she wants you to answer it. He was about to push my sister down the stairs. She was attempting to break us up. I am protective over my baby sister. When he laid hands on her, I don't know what I did. But I know I jumped in between the actions that I saw could lead to a fatal injury to my sister. She was standing on the top of a flight of the stairs and she has never hurt anyone in her life and she does not deserve to be pushed down the flight of stairs. And it looked like she was about to be. And I would have done what anybody who has a child or a sister would have done. I acted defensively in her life. I saw her standing on top of a flight of his stairs and trying to interrupt a fight in between him and I. I don't know what part of my body I, I put in between me and him and, and her. But I would have done anything. I would have done anything. 
to prevent her from being pushed on a flight of stairs. This is, now this footage here is a prime example of manipulation, guys. So she is saying that she hit Johnny because she was trying to protect her baby sister. She's trying to evocate feelings of sympathy in people. What a poor, vulnerable little baby. Babies need protection. She's saying, I just hit him because I had the best excuse in the whole wide world. I was trying to protect my baby sister. She was asked a simple yes or no question. Did you hit Johnny Depp? She should just said, yes, I did, okay? But she comes up with this a narrative of why she did it. So that immediately shows that she's in the defensive mode. So if there's one thing that I've learned from this channel, it's an amazing channel, it's called The Behavioral Arts. And it's this behavior analyst and he mind blows me every single time. Go check out his channel, he's amazing. One of the things that I learned from him is that truth tellers tell and liars sell. And so when being asked yes or no questions and we don't directly answer the question but try to like justify it with this story about how she saved her baby sister from fatal injuries and she's trying to put herself as like this hero of the story when she's actually an abuser, she's trying to sell you a story. And so that right there is a reason why we should question exactly what she's saying. And then something that she does quite a few times is that she's always like, I don't remember how I hit you. I don't know what I did. So when we see this um, selective memory loss, this is actually extremely common on narcissists. It's just a manipulation technique to avoid responsibility. What are you talking about? And I, I watched you lie. And then I, I didn't punch you, and by the way. You, I'm sorry that I didn't uh, you, uh, uh, punch hit you. Me across the face in a proper slap, but I was hitting you. It was not punching you. Babe, you're not punched. Don't tell me what it feels like to be punched. You, you know, you've been a lot of fights, been around a long time. I know. Yeah, no, I when you have a closed you fist. You punched. You got hit. I'm sorry I hit you like this, but I did not punch you. I did not deck you. I was hitting you. you I don't know what me. the po motion of my actual hand was, but you're fine. I did not hurt you. I did not punch you. I was hitting you. How are your toes? How, what am I supposed to do? Do this? How are your I, toes? I'm not sitting here bitching about it, am I? You are. Oh, That's the difference you between me toes. and you. You're a baby. Because you start you physical fights? You are such a baby! Because you, the because you start me. physical fights? I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did, so I had because, to get out of there. Yes, you did. So you did the right thing, the big thing. The, you know what? You are admirable. In this audio, we can hear that she actually admits to hitting him, to initiating the physical fight. And so let me just clarify, when you initiate a physical fight, you're not hitting somebody in self-defense. You are the actual abuser. And then she says, <laughs> just because I didn't give you a perfect slap doesn't mean I punched you. If you hit somebody with a fist, like that is the definition of punching. This is a classic example of gaslighting. And who gaslights? Narcissists. Vulnerable narcissists gaslight. Grandiose narcissists, they gaslight. And people with borderline personality, they do this as well. I'm, I'm telling you if, you, if you lost memory last night of kicking me out the door with the fucker hitting me. Again, and you sorry. And your memory is gone from uh, you kicking the the bathroom door and, and hitting me in the skull as I was bent down. I am Wait, sorry. if you have those memory uh, 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 fucking you know di divots. I was upset. There was a lot wait, going on, okay, and I was in, wait, on an ambient. Okay, like why? Like, why are you obsessing over the fact that I can't remember it the way you remembered it? I said I was sorry. Okay, I didn't deny I know it. That I'm not talking about. It's just to get out of a bad situation while it's happening before it gets worse. In Australia, when we had the big fight where I lost the tip of my finger, at least five bathrooms and two bedrooms I went to. To, to... To avoid talking to me. To, to avoid escape, the, me to the, escape the fight. You don't escape the fight. You escape the solution. No. You escape the solution. No. You s escape figuring it out. We cannot work it out if you run away to the bathroom every time. Listen to me. Listen to me. 
A boxer can't go 12 rounds without a fucking minute break. I'm not not giving you a minute break. You do it at minute three at the beginning of an argument. No. There are rounds, man. And when it gets too fucking hairy, the ref splits them apart or whatever. But I'm, I'm, all I'm saying is you, 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 you can't have a solution if the argument just keeps mounting and mounting and mounting and mounting. I fucking go to the, into the bathroom and sit on the floor. Bam, 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 here you come. I come out. Fight, 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 crazy, escalated. I go, I split again, I go to another fucking bathroom or a bedroom or something. Knock, 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 bang, bang, bang. You kept coming to get me. I'm not the one who fucking throws fucking pots and... That's a diff that's different. Else at me. That's different. That's what one does not... <laughs> Negate the other. It's irrelevant. It's a complete non sequitur. Just because I've thrown pots and pans does not mean that you vases. come and knock on the door. Just because there are vases does not mean that you come and knock on the door. Really? I should just let you throw. I'm not saying that. You're saying that. You're putting words in my mouth and then making no, non sequitur. I'm giving you a situation. No, you're trying to justify how you don't or do come to the door no, based I'm on whether I throw pots and pans. It's irrelevant. No, I'm justifying how you. you, you, you seem to think that there's this cowardice in me that runs away and I don't fight for you. And you're justifying that by saying I throw pots and pans? Okay, cool. Let's no, talk about everything you do wrong. I'm not the one. I'm just really surprised that this is not like a murder case because when you throw pots and pans at somebody, you could really injure them, injure their head. There is a lack of thinking. And that lack of thinking and that impulsivity is seen in borderline personality a lot. Actually, um, one of the biggest signs of borderline personality is when the person like gets so angry that can't control their anger and they just start throwing things. People with cluster B personality pathology and people with sociopathy, they seem to have a deep lack of insight. And this is actually a core trait of that whole cluster. I know sociopathy is its own mental illness, but they all share this deep lack of insight. When she admits to initiating the physical abuse, it's like in her head it's not that big of a deal. They don't realize how horrendous that is. They don't realize how reckless that is. So a disregard for safety would be a characteristic of this type of thinking. People with sociopathy do experience a need for stimulation. And I do think that Amber's need for stimulation is in fighting. We can see how Johnny Depp's kept saying, she's just always looking for a fight. First of all, a lot of times when the person develops sociopathy, they have being brought up in a very turbulent environment, the same as when somebody, you know, has borderline personality or narcissistic personality. They've grown up in chaos, in abusive homes a lot of the times. And so for their mind to be at ease, they have to have chaos. They have to have fighting because that's how everything was when they were growing up. And so it's like a sense of being at home that is provided by having a fight. Just like a person would go to somewhere peaceful to experience peace, an abuser, they feel at peace after an argument. And it's not something that they're consciously aware of that, but it's something that because their brain has grown up to learn that, that's what they constantly gravitate towards. And in fact, when they are in a very peaceful relationship, they'll always be questioning what's wrong, what am I missing? I'm, I'm telling you if, you, if you lost memory last night of kicking me out the door with the fucker hitting me, Again, and, you mi and your memory is gone from uh, you kicking the, the bathroom door and, and hitting me in the skull as I was bent down. I am Wait! Sorry. If you have those... Isn't it true that on this tape that was just played, you tell Johnny Depp you're sorry? Yes. Okay. If you're defending yourself against this terrible, horrible male abuser and you have to put a door in between you two, you don't just later apologize for 
putting that door in between you two. So this is a sign that she probably was just initiating that type of abuse. I think it's really interesting the way in which she just says, yes, I apologized. Mm -hmm. Do you see how good I am? We do see this type of behavior in vulnerable narcissism because that's what they, they love to portray this image of the innocent victim. Johnny Depp said that she did talk about suicide. I couldn't live without you. If you leave me, I'm gonna kill myself. This is, guys, this is basically a manipulation technique. People with borderline personality do this a lot. Now, that does not mean that people with borderline personality are never going to commit suicide because they do commit self-mutilation. Dealing with this type of manipulative abuser, you do have to pay attention to the context. A lot of the times they do use threats of suicide to get what they want. About to be testified to. Oh, if you can, if you can make that clear, I guess. Um, let, let me ask you a different question, Mr. Depp. Um, yes, let's let him object to another one. <laughs> um, how often would Miss Heard drink in your presence while you were in a relationship? Always. Well, yeah. Uh, Miss Heard drank. Uh, she took a shine to a very nice Spanish wine called Vega Cecilia. She and all her friends did. Um, and, um, yeah, the wine would would come out and uh, Miss Heard could uh, very easily drink two bottles of wine per night. Well, not a, not a problem. Um, what I found strange was when I did, um, did get sober from, from the, uh, well, I was off the um, the opiates that I had that I had been addicted to prior prior, prior to a year or so before, a couple of years before. Um, she asked me if I would stop drinking to save the relationship. Of course, and I stopped drinking, and um, I always found it odd that. in support of me not drinking, um, that she might stop drinking. Uh, but she did not. She continued. And I, I didn't make a big deal about it. In fact, I would open her, I would open her wine, I would pour her a glass, and that went on for many, many months, you know, in, in my sobriety. Uh, like I said, I think I was sober for around 18 months. Narcissists do have a very, very strong need of control to feel like they're in the superior position. So with narcissism and with controlling other people when you're a narcissist, there comes a lot of hypocrisy. So they want you to do certain things and that they're not willing to do themselves. An honest person that cares deeply about their partner that has full on empathy and they're dating an alcoholic and they really are serious about wanting this person to stop drinking or stop doing drugs. When they're trying to help them get over that, they don't just open a bottle of wine next to them because they have enough empathy to be like, oh, maybe this is not the best, most helpful thing to do next to the addict right now because it's going to trigger them to fail and give up, right? But she obviously did not care. The following footage is going to be an example of how frustrating it is to be with somebody that is a narcissist, how it's absolutely impossible to ever make them happy. That everything started going sideways. I, I, I was doing anything I could to bring a smile to her face as opposed to the frown and then the onslaught of whatever um, whatever problems she, 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 she was seeing or experiencing 
This manifests in two different ways. So for example, if you are with a grandiose a narcissist, they will let you know that you're just not at their level, that you will never be at their level, and they always have this like attitude of disappointment towards you, but they don't seem necessarily sad or worried all the time. But when you are with a vulnerable narcissist, and I do see some of that behavior here in Amber, a vulnerable narcissist is a person that's always anxious and worried. You can never make a vulnerable narcissist happy. You can buy them the nicest presents and no matter what you do, they're always worried, they're always sad, they're always unsatisfied and in truth, there really is nothing that you could possibly do because their problem is in their head. Because we don't know exactly what any, what's going to happen in 10 years. We don't know. So the road is what I pay attention to and paying attention to try, trying to spend as much time with my children uh, as possible. Um, even that, even that uh, would, uh, that could, send Miss Hurd into a, a monumental tailspin um, where I could, I could hardly ever go and see my kids and spend time with my kids because she had to have me there at all times for her own needs. <laughs> and here I also wanted to add that it's not just jealousy that we see here in, in, in not wanting him to visit his kids. It's that narcissists, because of their strong need of control, they don't like when you have a close relationship with anyone else but them. Here we see more of a fear of being abandoned. He did mention how on her birthday there was a big chunk of his money that was missing, a huge amount. Narcissists are notorious for overspending and they're notorious for lying. And when I say lying, I don't mean changing the truth. I mean hiding what they do entirely. Hiding an affair, hiding their overspending. Also when he was an hour and 40 minutes late to her birthday because he was on this meeting supposedly after everybody left she punished him by berating him, devaluing him and then on top of that she supposedly pooped on his bed and blamed the dogs. If this is true I do see sadism here doing something to cause pain because by causing pain a vulnerable narcissist can relieve their pain. I'm sure if this is true she had a great poop on his bed and she was just looking forward to sending that photo to him. And before I forget I wanted to mention how when considering whether any of her statements is true. Let's let's be objective here because guys, people who do suffer from sociopathy and narcissistic personality are a lot of the times pathological liars. So it's not like we are judging information that's being said by a person that has no personality pathology whatsoever. We are hearing this information from somebody that doesn't just have one personality disorder, not two personality disorders, but she has sociopathy on top of that. Please, let, let's let's be realistic for a moment before we believe everything she says, okay? That's, that's all I'm saying. He claims at one point that Amber calls him a monster, even though she refers as herself as having demons and those demons coming out. Okay, so here's an example of projection. That's super, super typical in narcissistic behavior because all they want to do is redirect the attention but also deflect responsibility. If I'm acting like a monster but I call you a monster, then your attention is gonna be focused on defending yourself instead of focusing on how much of a monster I actually am. Just because there is a person in a relationship that might be super toxic, it does not mean that the other party is completely innocent, okay? So there can be and often is the case that when encountered a relationship when there is a lot of toxicity, both people are actually engaging into toxic behavior. I don't have anything else to add. With that said, I hope you have a good day or night and I'll see you soon.